Hello, and thank you for joining us for the second episode of the Digital Transformation of the Legal Industry webinar series. This episode will present an SLW digital transformation case study, an overview of SLW systems, tools, data lake, processes, teams, and personnel. This is the second episode in an eight part series. A recording of the webinar and the slides will be made available to all registrants. Feel free to enter any questions using the Q&A feature in the Zoom menu. We invite you to follow us on LinkedIn to see news about other upcoming webinars. And with that, I'll turn things over to our moderator. Hey, th thanks, Michelle, and welcome everybody. <clears throat> yeah, today we're gonna be uh, reviewing what Schweigman has been working on in digital transformation. Um, and our panelists, some of them are, will be familiar to you. Uh, start out uh, with Sunil Rora, who is principal at the firm and has been very actively involved in our digital transformation efforts. Um, and he will be speaking on some of the tools that he's been most closely involved developing in, in recent years. Uh, Milena Higgins is with us and she's our chief of data analytics. Elena will be talking about um, how the firm is using analytics in its operations and how that's configured. We've got uh, Scott Otto, who's our application support specialist at the firm. Scott's had a very long tenure at the firm working with our uh, automation tools and, and our core database, Foundation IP. We're really glad Scott is going to be sharing some of his knowledge today. And last but not least, Jill Young, who's our software manager and who has personally done a lot of programming for us um, over the years and uh, probably now is doing the work of about, her, her software probably does the work literally of about 20 people uh, or more. Um, so thank you, Jill. But Jill will be sharing some of her nuggets today too. So with that, let's move on to the first slide. And this one's gonna be, we're gonna, Sunil is gonna take it, first and kind of give us a little overview and then we're going to dive into the, the nuts and bolts. Go ahead, Sunil. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Steve. So first of all, I just want to start out by saying that um, I'm going to give the user perspective for this technological transformation. All the other panelists that are in this webinar are the ones that are really responsible for you know, driving the implementation and for the, the, the business vision. But I think it's important to start out with the user perspective and to always keep the user perspective in mind as you look to what you're trying to achieve in your transformation. And I thought that the best way to start out would be just to take a look back um, at the journey that our firm has been on um, and the transformation that has occurred over the period of years. So that's all tried to, uh, it's all laid out in this slide here. Uh, the picture on the left shows what the situation was like in the 1990s, um, in the early 90s when I joined the firm and that was an era of paper files. Um, there were legal assistants, uh, uh, a lot of meetings uh, that you would do in person. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's useful to look at that whole, uh, the metaphor of the paper files and, and uh, to understand how things operated back then. So back in the days of paper files, um, you know, sometimes those paper files were left outside your office. And so one question to think about as we're looking at how things have transformed is, you know, does email work that way in terms of prioritizing what you attend to first um, versus, um, you, know, uh, you know, what's on your list of things to do. Um, and then, you know, my uh, recollection of the days of the paper files is they would show up with a rubber band around them. And the really important stuff that you need to look at was at the top of the paper file. Um, so there's st still some, you know, digging around that um, was required, but um, in, in the paper file, but there was some degree of sorting that was done. Um, so then in the late 1990s, Foundation IP was invented actually at the firm by Steve Lundberg and others. Um, and what that actually did is it, um, it transformed things to put everything online. Um, it since... Uh, it has since been sold off to CPA Global, but a lot of investment and time uh, went into uh, inventing that and developing that. And what that did is it gave us access. Uh, so now all of a sudden with Foundation IP, 
you had um, your files online, um, you know, 24 seven, and they were available to you. Um, so that foundation IP model was really what um, enabled our firm to grow tenfold during, you know, from the 90s into the 2000s. It was really the backbone of, of um, what we were able to do. We ended up um, hiring a lot of what we called satellite attorneys and working remotely, and it enabled us to do that. And now, of course, we're all still sitting at home. Everybody's working remotely. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we've done a lot of building on top of that to, to do more than just um, treat the issues of access and availability for people to be able to work from home anywhere, uh, but to start thinking about workflow as well. So the uh, Foundation IP uh, drove our firm's growth through uh, the two, 2000s, and we're continuing to use it. Um, but we have a lot of uh, build-ons, and some of those are what we're going to be talking about in this discussion. Um, the, the other thing that I want to talk about in terms of, you know, where things were left off in terms of after conquering the, um, the goals of access and availability with Foundation IP, you know, there's still the issues of autonomy and asynchronicity that we have been dealing with in the 2000s in terms of trying to figure out how to use our tools uh, more efficiently. And so a lot of our work in the 2000s has been to try and empower people to use the online tools more efficiently, um, to be able to integrate the tools with their own personal workflow so that they can be productive and add value. So it's one thing to have your information available online, but um, you know when I started to get involved in this um, was um, in, in the um, early 2000s uh, when it's, it still seemed to me like um, the tasks that were sitting in front of me on a monthly paper docket that was being delivered to me felt a lot like a job jar without any ability to actually organize the tasks, to track the progress of the tasks and to, um, and to actually manage those, those jobs. And so that's uh, where I got involved in this process. Um, so th the issue with asynchronicity is it does let you work on your own schedule, but it also lets you work all the time. And so we're trying to figure out ways to, you know, deal with digital transfer weight digital transformation in a way that really makes sense from uh, the standpoint of productivity and value. Um, so next slide. So, you know, just to kind of recap the first slide, automation should at the very least be better than the paper files that we had. So, I mean, when you had paper files, um, you could actually organize them, you could stack them, you could prioritize them. You know, automation to some degree, it eliminates the physical metaphor, you know, so all the files look the same and all the tasks have the same apparent priority. And so we need to figure out how to um, change that so that people can actually manage their files without going to having a legal assistant do them for, do that sort of file management uh, for them. Uh, so that has been a lot of what our efforts have uh, been involved in. So automation, I think, you know, brings new opportunities and it brings new problems as well. So, um, you know, automation from my standpoint was certainly better than paper files. You know, my office was full of paper files and um, uh, I had uh, no trouble in terms of adapting to being able to put all that stuff online. But, you know, if you are making that transformation uh, to digital files, you know, you might want to ask, are people starting to create their own shadow files? Um, and if they are, you're wasting people's valuable time in terms of making them make their own shadow files. You're not optimizing uh, the, the online and available files for that person's workflow. Uh, and you also could be diminishing access uh, to the work product by other team members. So we have to be careful in terms of how we're implementing autom um, automation. Um, you know, a another thing to think about is, um, you know, the whole asynchronicity of, uh, of the workflow that automation imposes. You know, the notion of emails and, uh, you know, uh, chat strings and Slack versus synchronous, meet, synchronous um, communication like meetings and calls. Um, asynchronous communication is notoriously inefficient, but that's really kind of the world that we have been pushed into. Um, you know, another thing about um, 
you know, automation is that, um, you know, clients have a variety of their own systems. So there is the whole notion of uh, interop interoperability between uh, systems. Um, you know, who is going to actually curate the systems? Is data entry being done on the law firm side, on the, um, on the, uh, on the client side, uh, or, or is it being done twice? In which case it's just adding an efficiency into the system. Uh, another issue with automation is to how to capture the value of the automation or actually um, at least avoid taxing yourself by, um, by adding um, inefficiency uh, through uh, a badly thought out automation process. So, you know, the bottom line is a digital transformation should unleash the potential uh, of the, the underlying data. Uh, we can get data from a lot of different sources and at Schwegman, we pull that into um, what it is that we uh, present to uh, our attorneys. So it's, it's more than access and work from home um, that we're trying to solve at this point. Next slide. So, um, you know, our efforts really are on automation that empowers attorneys to be creative and adds value. And so, the, you know, the first notion that I want to add is um, we want to automate in a way that um, that is actually efficient and focused. So less is more. And we are, we are really trying to um, implement automation that is driven towards work processes. So to help our attorneys prioritize tasks, to screen, um, to actually present information in a packetized way so that um, it uh, you know, filters out some of the noise and gives more signal to the uh, attorney so they can focus on the actual underlying substantive task and that the information is available at a time when it's appropriate to the workflow. So in terms of this slide, you know, we've had a couple of steps, you know, along the way. And in some of the early automation efforts that we had, it was just passing along things in an email workflow. And one thing that I think we want to be very careful about is breeding cockroaches in the inboxes of others, whether it's other people within the firm or on the client side. And so that is something that, um, was a step along the way. And so a lot of what we have been doing has been to try and transform things more into batch mode processing or um, you know, on-demand sorts of uh, uh, processing of tasks. So um, you know, one of the things about tasks in a docket, um, at least when you are um, looking at things online, is that they could all superficially appear to have the same uh, urgency. And so there's really a gap that exists between uh, some of the automation and um, you know, the ability for people to prioritize. And we're really um, very conscious of the fact that context switching requires tremendous resources uh, to switch between tasks. And so we are trying to automate in a way that lets people uh, process what they knew, need to do in batch mode so as to be more efficient. So, you know, managing dockets, task switching, looking for information, all of those things are um, efficiency killers and they're all symptoms of the asynchronicity in uh, process flow that uh, can be created by automation. The picture on the right here is really the goal of what we're trying to get to, which is having the right tools available at the right time. And you know, if you look at the picture uh, on the right where you have the interventionist and you have this, the assistant, that's really a synchronous collaboration that's occurring between two people. Um, so that's a very efficient uh, and a very efficient way to collaborate and um, also there is expertise on both sides. There's expertise on the assistant side in terms of knowing which tool to provide to the interventionist and there is um, expertise on the um, interventionist side. So we are really trying to automate in a way that um, can let somebody um, do the substantive work that they need to with the best possible tools and the best uh, possible leverage data from all the different um, sources. Uh, next slide. So the last slide was really just to emphasize that, you know, we want to try and keep people focused. We want to have them have the right tools at the right time. But, uh, you know, and the less is more. 
but I also want to make the point that more is also more. Um, you know, the way we are presenting work product to uh, attorneys is to focus their field of view so that they can focus on the tasks at hand. But there are also a lot of things that we can do to increase their visibility so that, you know, the prosecution uh, doesn't become untethered from the business exact, uh, objective, uh, from the technology landscape, the IP landscape, to help people do issue spotting and to help ensure accuracy. So really there's two competing things at play in how we're implementing automation. One is packetizing work to provide focus. And the other thing is augmenting and actually adding more information uh, to pull in useful uh, information that would otherwise be unattainable uh, to attorneys as they are going through their, um, their tasks. Next slide. And I think the next slide is going to be handled by someone else. It's, it's my slide, Sunil. Okay. Hey, th thanks, thanks so much, Sunil. And as you were uh, finishing up there, I thought, yes, I think we need Google Glasses. And as we were looking at your patent document, you see all kinds of uh, information popping up about who's going to be stealing this idea and how you're going to stop them. But I mean, literally, that's kind of what we're headed for. Um, or what we're aiming to do is really bring more context to a lot of these things. So let me now segue to um, just kind of like what Schweigman does in terms of its, its overall data collection and a little bit about how it's got its data organized and then a little bit um, about the kinds of tools and people that we have. And then we'll dive into some specific examples of things. So Essentially what Schweigman currently does is collects data from a lot of different sources and it uses all this data in various different ways. But we, like a lot of firms, of course, we collect data from the USPTO, all of the data that comes in from the USPTO portal, all the data that's emailed to us by, you know, the PCT uh, or the patent office. Um, we will go in and actually scrape data out of pair um, and we collect all that data and we process that data in various different ways. And we'll talk about some of those. We, we also get full libraries of international patent data. Um, and we buy this from uh, services that clean it up and deliver it to us in a, in a form that we can use in various different ways. I mean, one of the key ways we use it is to just to make sure that our dates are accurate. Um, uh, but we also use it for analytics. Um, and then we have uh, data that's available through Global Dossier. And there, again, you can get file histories for uh, many countries uh, currently, or at least a number of countries, the IP5 for sure. Um, you can get citation information. Um, and we use this information in different ways too. We use some of the file histories from the EP in China and Korea and Japan, uh, Canada, to actually help us with our automated docketing processes. Um, we also use IDS data to help us populate uh, IDS information, especially when we're booting up um, you know, a new client and we need to go back. And then we actually go out to certain countries and actually pull file histories uh, from those countries, um, from their pair systems. And that's becoming a, a more reliable and robust way to, to collect data. So we're, we're gathering a lot of data. So there's a lot of people involved to keep all these systems running 24-7 um, because many of our processes need this data uh, on, a, on a momentary basis. And if any of these things aren't working, it stops everything. So next slide. Okay, so then we have, you know, that's kind of the external data we're pulling in. Um, and then we have other sources of data. We have all of the data that we essentially generate at Schweigman, which is often, you know, derivative of the data that we're pulling in um, from the patent offices. It's derivative of the client data, which we're also pulling in. And so that data comes to us a lot of times in emails. Occasionally, we're asked to go out and retrieve it from a client database. Um, or for some, I should say, some clients require us to do that. And that's one way we get data, but we're pulling that data in. We're getting um, 
some you know other data that just flows in with regular sort of emails, the, the normal stuff, you have face-to-face -face meetings, there's data like that, sort of traditional collection of mail, some of that gets scanned and we pull that in. Um, we don't capture every last um, you know, conversation, obviously on the phone or anything like that, but we keep, you know, we put the notes in, it's all in there. And then we kind of have, um, you know, kind of our data lake. Um, we're assembling all these things. We're putting packets together. We're gonna talk about that. We're transforming this data in a, in a number of different ways in order to, to uh, provide analytics and provide it to the, the attorneys and to generate a myriad of different automated documents and processes. And um, <clears throat> it's hard to even count how many programs we have running at any point in time, but it's got to be well into the, you know, it's probably approaching 500 different, you know, pieces of code that are operating, if it's not more, every day, all day long, over and over, um, ceaselessly processing data. So next slide, please. So you can kind of look at the big picture is we've got all this data flows in, we process a lot of it, we keep a lot of it in a data lake, um, you know, which is just the, the latest uh, label for collecting data in various different databases. Although nowadays we're more uh, content with aggregating data in its raw form in the data lake um, and then reprocessing it as we need to later as opposed to trying to normalize everything and stuff it into databases. But um, that's definitely an important aspect of what we do. Next slide, please. So let's just talk about the different tools we use for just a second. Um, one of the tools that Sunil and uh, Jill are, go are going to address in a minute is Task Manager. Um, we have another tool called Sidebar. These are all pretty uh, big programs um, that sit on our network and, and run 24 seven. IP Tools is another one. And that one focuses on processing data in from the outside and automated docketing and loading stuff into foundation IP automatically. Um, I just checked yesterday and we passed the 200,000th mark for number of US patent uh, docketing items that we'd processed fully automatically from the USPTO over the last three years. In other words, they came in, they didn't, no one touched them and they went directly into foundation IP with docketing dates. Um, and there's a, just a ton of software behind that, um, not only to process it in, but there's also a whole complete system that checks the data once it's in there. Um, and that gives us a full loop, uh, closed loop system. We have a whole, a number of web services for foundation IP. Uh, of course we have Adorant for our accounting and we do a lot of integration with that. We have all kinds of miscellaneous tools, a database called Amazing Grace. And this is a database that focuses just on making sure we don't miss those critical dates, which are killer if you miss them. And um, I'm not going to tell you how long we've gone without missing one because it would jinx us, but it's been a long while. And then, you know, we have a file opening supervisor program that helps us open files to make sure that we don't lose track of things, make sure the dates. We have another program or we use SharePoint and Teams a lot. Scott Otto works with those a lot. So next slide, we need to keep it rolling here because we're getting a little bit, might be getting a little bit behind. And then, um, you know, these are just more tools that we use, Power BI. We have bill coding tools, AI tools, um, foundation IP billing tools, foundation IP filing tools. We have IDS managers, we have IDS generators, automated report outs, uh, tools to help us, you know, actually build the stuff once it's been uh, determined. So performance and capacity tools, we have just a lot of tools that we use every day. And of course it takes a village um, to do this. So we have quite a big staff. And I think this uh, of automation expertise and personnel, and I think this speaks to the digital transformation. It's not about as much any one little thing you do to automate something digitally, but this is a workforce transformation that's going on right now. I mean, we're, we're transforming the workforce. Um, we're never gonna not have paralegals. We're never not gonna have lawyers, 
But what we're going to have is we're going to get a lot of more pro productivity out of the paralegals that we do have because they're going to be having bots doing a lot of work for them. So we have foundation IP configuration specialists. These are people that just configure foundation IP to do the things we need. It's very configurable. We have people that just work on the web services. We have IP tools developers full time. We have people that configure IP tools uh, for automated docketing and stuff. We have people that just focus on getting the data into the firm. So there's a lot of different people and we have really dozens of people that support our programming and IT. And it's been that way for ages. And I, I wouldn't even wanna to try to guess how many hours we put into that. Next slide. So now I'm gonna segue over to Scott Otto, who's our foundation IP expert. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, as Steve went through his list of the many, many things that we, the tools that we use and, and the software that we use, Foundation IP came up a lot. And we can leverage Foundation IP in so many different ways because we can customize information there in there. We can customize activities to um, have cl client directed due dates or processes. Um, we have custom matter fields to be able to track client specific data or terminology. Um, and then of course we have reports that we leverage uh, an awful lot and send out to clients on schedules or we use them for dockets, whatever the case might be. Um, and he talked about web services a lot and we were, we drove um, the need for having access to foundation IP data and being able to change the data from outside of the user interface. That was a huge undertaking for us. We needed that. And the first thing that we got uh, was the re email reply ID. Uh, later on, Sunil is gonna talk about something called FIP filing or FIP references um, and even billing we can send in via an email and have it go to the right spot in Foundation IP because of those web services. So we get email reply IDs, we get billing um, entries that we can put in um, and we can do contact changes. Uh, we do that uh, uh, an awful lot. Um, we will get spreadsheets from clients and uh, they'll ha say, you know, please update these matters to have this, you know, personnel change. And we can do all those through the web services. And those things, actually came about because we worked with our vendor. Um, although we created Foundation IP at, at um, you know, with, with the members of the firm, uh, once Foundation IP was sold, we really didn't have a whole lot of control in the development. So one of the things that um, Foundation IP did was they started a uh, software innovation board. And because we were asked to be on that board, that is how we were able to get um, the changes that we needed so we could move forward and continue pushing our business forward and our automation forward. And that is pretty much why we are where we are today um, because Foundation IP is such an integral part of our, our firm. Next slide, please. And I'll pass things over to Jill. Thank you, Scott. So <clears throat> now it's time to talk about the middleware. And I think the best place to start is um, a definition. So if you look it up, it is actually defined as computer software that provides services to software applications beyond those available from the operating system. And some describe it as the software glue. <clears throat> so one of the things, and I've been involved in many, many software implementations, which sometimes you're starting from scratch, sometimes you're migrating from one software application to another. And the first thing that you realize in this process is that the software solution can't do all things you intended it to do. And even when you've been careful about your analysis in the selection process. So what comes next is, do we go to the vendor and request customizations, which can be costly and sometimes ineffective in accomplishing the required functionality that you actually need? So enter in the middleware, which typically requires a software developer, someone who can work with data, but what it does for you in that end 
is it promotes independence and agility in your organization across depart departments and across all the different softwares that you actually have. Um, so how do you do this? Well, my the thing that I harp on the most is anytime you are implementing software or purchasing new software is you need to have the data. You need to have access to the data. And that's either by directly having the database reside within your own network or having access to it through some kind of external uh, connection, be it SQL or whatever the database is, or web services. Um, I always say your best bet is direct data access. It gives you the most flexibility in how you're going to to work with it. However, APIs and web services provide a lot of that functionality as well. If you get both, that's an extra bonus. Um, gives you um, ability to do a lot of different things. One thing I will say is, is um, and we've always been very careful about this, and that's why web services are best when they give you functionality to update the data Otherwise, my recommendation is when you're building your middleware is to do only read access of the data. Um, a lot of the data, unless it's being updated via a web service or the recommended or preferred interface for doing it, is you can do a lot of damage if you're, if you're not careful in that realm. So enter our middleware, which is this slide here, which is, um, Sidebar, and it, it was born out of the, what we've just discussed. We needed to um, leverage our existing software or enhance it, um, create customizations or standardizations, um, and also to increase some of the productivity um, that wouldn't otherwise uh, be available. So as we look at the slide, some of the areas that we've been able to achieve that is um, in merges. Merges expand to a lot of different areas in our firm. Um, we have customers who require certain specifics when we're filing assignments with the PTO or when we're working with them in organizing uh, application filing or a response to an action and they require certain documents filled in with um, the information we have, the data that we hold. So with this ability of accessing the data, we can create those in the form of Word documents, um, PDF documents. Um, we, we use it to uh, send the transmittals to the PTO. So there's a variety of different ways that we use merges. Currently we have um, a library of over 400 active merges that are used um, on a daily basis between our paralegals and our case management people. The other, another area is custom reports. Um, we have a matter management system, which is foundation IP. Oftentimes that needs to integrate and mingle with the data from our accounting system. Um, it helps us with budgeting, it helps us with um, understanding the various facets of what happens in this stage and how much we've spent on this particular stage. So we, we often times will need reports that can combine the, both of those, both of those systems to, to help monitor and to help guide us in, in how we're going. Another area is mass updates. And I think Scott touched on this with the web services with the, with the contact information. Um, and he, he is right in that oftentimes we'll get a very, um, a very archaic or very simplified spreadsheet saying we need all of, our, all of our matter numbers updated to be this and all we'll have is their matter number and what the new one is. So with that, and with access to our data and the web services, we can, we can affect those mass updates um, with even the very simplistic data that, that we receive in order to be able to do it. Uh, with our accounting, we've, um, uh, we've 
done a little variety of different things with them. Um, leads formats is a big area for that where the, account, the accounting system has the ability to create different leads formats, but oftentimes it's not customized enough for the client. So we will actually take the leads format and go about reformatting a lot of the data in it to meet the customer requirements. Uh, we basically have built our own collection module. Um, we needed a lot of more information and some custom fields that weren't available in the accounting system. So we've basically kind of taken off on our own tangent there and we've got our own collection letters. Um, we can track different stages with the aging and the payables. We've automated um, emails to keep us on top of our aging. We automated our own customization of our reminder statements to clients. So there were a variety of areas there that we were able to leverage by being able to have our middleware. And then again, what we've talked about with mass updates, we, we also can move client data from our matter management system into the accounting system to avoid that altogether double entry that we certainly don't want anyone have to do. Um, and then the last one that I'll mention before we move on is we actually were able to create a automated um, way of producing our 1449 forms based off of certain criteria. Um, if we have an application that's been filed that's older than uh, two, three months old, it hasn't had any um, office actions on it yet. Um, we have not filed an IDS yet. So we can, and we can look and see, well, are there references in that matter that we need to send? And rather than have someone go through a report, we actually have a process where we will, we will bring in that data and we will automatically generate the IDS, mail it to the signing attorney and to the IDS specialist on that matter so that they can review it and send it off. And that way they don't have to dig those out or try and find them or miss sending a 1449 when they need to. Uh, same is true with notice of allowance, which we actually scrape data from the PTO. Uh, we, can, we can know when something is going to allow even before we get the notice, the notice of allowance and the correspondence um, based on the change of status at the PTO of that particular application. So that's another incidence where we would then generate a 1449 if that particular matter had unmarked references in it. And with that, we can go to the next slide. This is just a real brief <laughs> uh, display of how we actually get from taking an action from the PTO and actually completing it through its entire workflow. So I'm just gonna read through these. It's pretty self-explanatory, but I'll just highlight uh, the benefits that we ha have along the way. So we, it starts at the PTO with, let's just go with an office action. We get that in our daily correspondence file that is automatically scraped from the PTO and brought into our IP tools software. It will consume that document, it will OCR it, um, and, and then it will um, auto docket it based on what we have in our rules engine for that particular document and the data and information we, we were able to pull off of that. Next comes the verification of that and that also is automated. However, if it falls out there, um, if the auto docketing fails, then it goes into a manual review and a manual verification but then we head it back over to the automation once that's been done and we report it out to the client via an email or their preferred way of receiving it. And then we have the ability to take what has been docketed and reported to the client and, and generate the billing for that particular transaction. We notify our internal personnel that it has come in. We then take that task and we download it into that attorney's outlook as a task that they will then be um, notified of when it comes due. And this is where we produce this work packet folder that will contain the documents that are required in order to get that filed to the PTO. And once it's been filed, then we automatically close it. 
And that's the kind of oversimplified view, but kind of um, shows how it starts from the PTO and then closes upon completion. Next slide. So I think, <clears throat> so this is Sunil, I'll take this uh, next slide here. Um, and this uh, is an example of something that was shown on my earlier slide. When we, the earlier slide showed a picture of a microscope and a fisheye lens. And the idea was that you would like to be able to give people focus, but you'd also like to expand their field of view. Um, you know, back in the days when all this automation became uh, available and the access became available, there was still the issue of some kind of a docket, um, whether it be a, a, pay, a monthly paper docket that would land on my desk or um, a docket that would be generated out of foundation IP that I still found you know, difficult to work with, a lot like the job jar uh, example that was um, presented in an earlier slide. And this is many years ago when I went and um, went to Jill and I asked her to help me uh, get a better way to work with, with, work with and manage my docket items. And that is where the task manager was born, which basically takes docket tasks out of the uh, foundation IP and it um, uh, delivers them into Outlook tasks for me that I can manage. Um, and then from those Outlook tasks and uh, via other ways, I can actually access hyperlinks into work packets, work folders that are a common shared folder structure that, um, that others in the firm could also access for that um, same sort of uh, task. And so those, um, those work packets include a number of things that allow me to focus on, for example, an office action response that is um, that uh, needs to be done quickly and efficiently. And so in that work packet um, that's accessible from the um, Outlook task, there would be uh, an OCR um, office action. There would be an automated shell response. It's been parsed and the appropriate language has been put into the draft shell response for me to start from. Uh, there would be uh, a, a copy of the previous response that I had filed in that case. If I wanted to look back at that, a copy of the application is filed or a published application, um, a copy, copies of any cited references, just those references that were relied upon in that office action um, as a basis of rejection so that I can review those and edit those and take notes on those. There is... Um, something called a claim tracker spreadsheet, which is basically an Excel spreadsheet that shows how the claims have evolved over the history of the examination, the originally filed claims, and then uh, you know any kind of cancellations or amendments or added claims. So you can actually get sort of a, um, uh, an overall view as to the evolution of where the case has been and uh, you know, the direction that it's taken. Also packaged up in that work packet is examiner analytics that tell me about um, you know, what that particular examiner is like that's um, on this case in terms of their allowance rates and, and um, you know, just various examiner statistics. If there are any business strategy notes in terms of the applicability of uh, what I'm working on to a particular product or to the business strategy of the client, that is all there in the work packet for me so that I can... Um, I can be aware of it and not be prosecuting a case in a vacuum. And I can um, uh, keep track of those things and manage it for people that are, might be looking at this case in the future. Um, we are able to flag things such as priority dates, you know, commonly owned assignees, you know, um, related cases in a way that makes, gives the attorney that kind of visibility as to you know, what else is going on in a family or uh, with other cases that are pertinent to a particular client product. And of course, there's a checklist in there as well. So, um, you know, quality control is something that we believe very strongly in. And uh, we're big believers in checklists. And so that is bundled up in the work packet as well. So I guess what I would say is that, um, you know, Foundation IP has a user interface that is, you know, one view of a file um, you know, one way to think of these work packets is, you know, moving information out of that paper file and putting it, um, you know, attaching it onto the top of the file with a rubber band, uh, but doing a lot more than that because there's just a lot more information that is now available. And, you know, I think the, the bottom line is that 
there's a lot more that you can do with um, data to help address rote tasks. And the example that I like to give to people is something uh, uh, like an obviousness type double patenting uh, rejection, which is not the most interesting subject in part because it's so rote and routine. And, um, but you know, wouldn't it be nice if for an obviousness type double patenting uh, rejection, you had packaged up for you, uh, you know, the expiration dates of the patents that you were being rejected upon. And if it were possible to know, you know, for those uh, other patents, you know, did they actually terminally disclaim third patents and, you know, what the chain is down that uh, to actually figure out quickly how much, um, how much term you would actually be giving up if you were to sign a terminal disclaimer. So that's the kind of information that we have access to and that we can make available uh, so an attorney wouldn't have to spend any time um, doing that. And, and then also, you know, in terms of those other patents for the obviousness type double patenting rejection, you know, what are the differences in claim language parsed out and presented and highlighted for the attorney? So if they want to challenge the obviousness type double patenting rejection, they can see what are the similarities and what are the differences and make a quick determination as to whether it's worth their time to uh, to make a challenge as opposed to citing a terminal disclaimer. So there's a lot of things that we can do with automation if we really think about what the routine tasks are and um, to keep the attorney focused on the substantive uh, things at hand. And, and these work packets are a really good way of keeping people focused, but yet still expanding their field of view. Next slide. Um, okay, so this slide really just talks about integration with existing tools. And um, I think we talked a little bit about how we have docket items that are propagated from Foundation IP to Microsoft Outlook tasks. And I did see a, a broader question that came in through the Q&A about integration. And, you know, there is the broader question about integration with everybody's existing tools, right? Because there are a lot of different systems that are out there that, you um, uh, different firms are working with and different clients are working with. And clearly there is a need for a common uh, interchange format um, so that work isn't being created in each of these individual repositories in moving information between repositories, whether it's docketing information or reporting information or actually moving files around. But within our system, we've tried to make it really easy to integrate with existing tools you know, recognizing that people are sometimes, uh, you know, filtering through emails. Um, we have uh, an easy way to email uh, information into foundation IP files. You can email notes or documentations into uh, the, the foundation IP file to pull out later. Um, if uh, you become aware of references that you need to attach to a file, you can email those into the foundation IP file without actually, you know, going into the foundation IP interface. So, and, and we can auto uh, schedule IDS submissions such as based on USPTO events. And that's really been a big help in helping uh, manage costs of avoiding fees for filing IDS or RCEs or that kind of thing. We can also email billing into the foundation IP file since sometimes the billing that um, uh, is being created is as a result of people working on emails and responding to things. So um, you, I guess the bottom line is we're not, um, we're not getting away from email anytime soon. Um, so we're trying to leverage it to make it more efficient and um, to maximize its value and, and minimize its burden and uh, uh, to help it integrate with our other tools. Um, let's see, this last one is really um, just about reporting. So we're, we are, you know, one thing to think about in terms of reporting and reporting via email is that um, you know, we have a lot of metadata that we can associate with the different kinds of reporting. So it gives our um, attorneys and our clients the ability to filter what they do and they don't wanna see. So um, again, this is along the theme of we're not getting rid of email anytime soon. So we would really like to give people flexibility to be able to uh, prioritize and, and tell what is urgent and what can be deferred. No, it's Neil, if I, this is Steve Lumberg, if I interject on that. Also, I think that reporting out has to do with our automated report outs. Um, once something's uh, been filed, we can automatically send it out um, and select different types of items to include 
for different clients and different needs. Next and I was, yeah, oh, I was oh, done oh. with that one. So I think we're ready for the next slide. I Great. think this is Milena. Yes, thank you, Steve right. um, and Sunil. So we've spent, uh, we've spent a lot of time up until now talking about um, our workflow automation and, and how the firm has accomplished many of the amazing things that, that you just heard about. Um, I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about what I consider to be kind of the next frontier in our digital ev evolution, and that is our analytics capabilities. So the goal of analytics is basically to help you make data-driven decisions. And as you just heard, we have a whole lot of data coming from a whole lot of different places that we can now use in many different ways uh, beyond workflow automation. Uh, so taking the example uh, problem as stated on the left is, is typically a management team or a client team might be getting reports and typically they're Excel files or PDF files that are just static snapshots of whatever data you're pulling for that report. Uh, the problem that arises with that kind of model, if you're getting a report, let's say once a month, and you need to look at something at the 28th day of the month and the report comes on the first, by the time you're looking at it on the 28th, that data is already almost a month old. So it can be stale for the purpose that you wanna use it. So this next tool that we, um, we started to use is, is something that helps with that. And many of you have probably heard of tools like Power BI or Tableau, and these are the tools that help you transform these static types of reports um, into real-time dashboards or real-time reports that you can pull um, when needed. And then the data is fresh. So um, with tools like Power BI, it acts a little bit like the data lake that Steve mentioned earlier, because you're collecting multiple data sources into one place, but it helps eliminate the problem that Jill talked about where you don't want to alter that original data because it's serving other purposes in the workflow. With tools like Power BI, what you do is you essentially make a copy of that data and then you can transform it for the purpose of the report, whether you're calculate, calculating some average or aggregating some numbers or whatever it is that you're doing. You're doing that separately from, you're not touching the original data. Tools like this also help eliminate the shadow file problem that Sunil mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. Because everyone's looking at the same data, you're not creating a copy of it and downloading it to your own desktop and then looking at some different version uh, from somebody else. And that the, the last benefit is that it's, the data is synchronized for all users. So everyone is looking at the same version and that data can be updated as often as you need. It could be updated daily, it could be updated hourly, it just depends on how you're using it. Uh, the other benefit of a tool like that is that it can, the reports that you're consuming are dynamic. So if, if Sunil wants to view things by client alphabetically, Sunil can click a button and sort that data alphabetically by client. But if Steve is looking at the same report and he wants it organized in some different way, in that very report, he can click a different button and sort it a different way. That's just a very simple example of, of how a tool like that can be, um, can be automatic and, dy and dynamic for the user. Uh, it also gives you drill down capability and I'm not gonna go into a lot of details because uh, that's probably a whole separate webinar on its own. Uh, but these are the tools that we are now using to, uh, to advance our progress in this digital evolution. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I'll just briefly mention some use cases of these projects, and we have two buckets of these, uh, the external and the internal, the external being uh, client projects that our firm works on. And some examples of those are portfolio analytics projects or landscape analytics projects or many other types of analytics that we do. 
And so now we can use these um, tools that I just talked about to help us do work on those projects. And one of the improvements we've already started to implement is a workflow improve improvement where instead of for each client project, manually pulling data out of a tool like a claim IP or some other tool that where, you, where you're searching for patents data uh, and pulling, pulling it into Excel and then doing bar charts or whatnot with Excel each time for every project. When you pull that data into something like Power BI, you can create that visualization once. And then the next project, you do, it, the data just automatically is made for you without you having to do a whole lot of upfront work. So it improves, again, the workflow, uh, takes it to the next level, makes things more efficient. Uh, and finally, um, the internal examples are various firm management uh, reports and dashboards that, that are used by our firm management. So for example, filing metrics, billing dashboards, patent budgeting tools, uh, things like that are also things that we can build and, and leverage this technology to help us get better at um, understanding that data and making business decisions. So with that, I will turn it over to, I think it's back to Sunil or maybe it's Scott. It's me, it's Scott. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're just about out of time here, but um, the big takeaway from today is data, 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 and efficiency, 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 um, and trying to weed through everything. And <clears throat> um, we thought we'd share uh, something that we're working on right now, which is um, for non-critical document signatures. Um, we have a, a staff group called the Case Management Group who merges documents from Foundation IP. And they send these documents to the attorneys and sometimes they have to follow up with them. Attorneys are focused on prosecution or um, helping their clients or whatever the case might be. And oftentimes these are the things that um, they need to be reminded about. So what we're trying to do is instead of relying on each person to create their own workflow uh, to have uh, maybe email filters set up because that's how they re receive the documents. Um, what we're trying to do is move to something where it basically creates a list of these documents and assembles them in a document repository so that when they do get the time, they can go through them. The attorneys can go through them in, in a batch process, if you will, and they can look at the documents and sign off on them. And um, so the case management group would merge the document, upload it into the attorney's repository, uh, send the attorney an email still with a link to the to their repository uh, of documents, and then the attorney, when they when they have the time, they get to sign and save the document. And right now, we're thinking about having them moving it into a, a subdirectory of completed documents to get it out of their list. Then the document creator gets a notification that the document has been changed, and they can go grab the document and file it. And the whole idea here is to honor the workflow uh, that we already have in place. I mean, people still do all this work. So we have to start kind of our seeds of automation with um, getting people to do things a little bit differently, where maybe in the future we can actually auto merge the documents and um, send them into the repository and then the attorney can do the part. I don't know what parts will be eliminated, but the biggest thing is if an attorney likes to do things one at a time, they can still do that this way. And if they like to let the documents assemble and do them once a week for an hour, they can do it that way as well. We're just trying to reduce stress and we're trying to reduce distractions. And the way we're gonna implement this um, is through SharePoint and OneDrive. So we are definitely trying to leverage um, the web interfaces. The pandemic kind of drove us to start looking at um, how SharePoint and Teams um, could be leveraged for, for our workflows. And it's a fairly easy development process, fairly easy, not totally easy. But the idea here, and as the, as the uh, screen shows, we're trying to make people happy and reduce their stress. And with that, I will turn it back over to Steve. Hey, 
Thank, thanks, Scott, and everybody that presented today. Um, that's a lot, and there's a, just a ton of uh, information there for our uh, listeners. I wanted to make a couple of, or put a couple of uh, explanation points after a few of the things that we talked about today. I mean, Sunil right away was talking about interoperability. And, you know, I think if there's one area where there's still a lot of friction in uh, where we could reduce costs a lot with the clients uh, and, and the firms and can get together uh, with interoperability, the more we can avoid having to push data through fingers, literally, um, the better the data quality is going to be and the faster it's going to happen and the cheaper it's going to be. You know, and, you know, the first step of every uh, <clears throat> department's uh, sort of digital transformation seems to be finding somebody else to do the manual work, which is uh, a time-honored tradition. And we understand why clients want to do that. We're happy to do it for them. But, at the same, but in, in the same vein, we really want to get the uh, tools that we, can, uh, we need to get into their systems to talk directly with their systems, with our systems, so that we don't have to use manual labor to do that work. We can take that data entry they want us to do and turn it into an automated process. And it's a win-win for everybody. And uh, a number of our clients have been really good working with us uh, to achieve that. And we're very grateful. Um, and I know all of them would like to give it to us as fast as they possibly could, but there are constraints. Um, they've got budget issues and they've got uh, IT security issues, but the more they can help us with that, the better. Um, and I would just say that, um, you know, there's certain uh, uh, vendors out there have done a, a terrific job. I wanna mention, you know, CPA Clarivate, um, FIP has just a fantastic API. Um, their IP folio has got a great API. Uh, Patrick's has a nice API. CPI has a nice API. AppCall has a nice API. They all have great APIs. And if, you're, if your vendor isn't in the list I just gave, you really need to talk to them because they're really a big barrier to digital transformation. If they won't give APIs or don't have an API, that's a big problem. Um, so you should talk to them about that. Um, the, let me see, there's a couple of questions that came in see if I picked them up at the end or I think they're all answered. So, and then one last thing is that it really takes a village to do digital transformation. And uh, every, there's so many great ideas that people have and the more you can implement, the better. If it's, a, it's not like a one little bit program, it does everything. It's gonna be hundreds of programs that make up that middleware Jill talked about. So uh, it's gonna take a lot of people doing it continuously uh, going into the future. It's not a one-shot deal. With that, I guess I'll just call it a day. Um, uh, thanks everybody for listening in. Uh, appreciate your uh, coming to the series and we look forward to talk, or, uh, talking to you next time. I think we're talking about um, using tools to automatically prepare or to help assist in the preparation of uh, applications and such. Um, so we'll, we'll, and it, Michelle, did you want to wrap up with any comments? You're exactly right, Steve. Um, we'd love to see everybody back on April 8th when we examine an SLW digital transformation case study in application preparation. And you can find the registration page on the SLW Institute on the SLW website. And please do keep an eye out for the email invitations as well. And thank you again, everybody, so much for joining us and be well.